I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Bob Beachler from Untether um, to uh, uh, make the first public disclosure of uh, Untether's uh, strategy and product. Uh, take it away, Bob. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And hello, everyone. Um, today, we come out of stealth mode. Um, so it's my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce you to the company and to our products. Um, first, a little bit about Untether. We were founded in 2018. We're located in Toronto. That's our headquarters. We have close ties to the University of Toronto and University of Waterloo, where there's a lot of AI activity going on. We have about 60 employees and we're venture capital backed. Uh, Radical Ventures is based in Toronto and they're an AI focused venture capital firm, as well as the small semiconductor company here in the Valley called Intel Capital. Um, we're very pleased to have these as our backers. And our mission is to really help companies that are executing AI workloads to do them faster, cooler, and cheaper. And we do that using something called at memory computation, which I will explain in some detail. Of course, everyone here knows what's going on in neural networks. The compute loads are doubling every three and a half months. It's really exploding. And it's far outstripping conventional processing approaches to be able to keep up with the increasing demand of these AI workloads. When Untether was founded, the team looked at this and said, where is all the energy being spent to do the AI functions, right? At this base, many of the functions are multiply accumulates. What they found was that 90% of the energy being used to do a multiply accumulate is actually in data movement, getting it from DRAM, storing it in local cache, fetching it from the cache, getting it to the multiply accumulate, and less than 10% of the actual energy was actually being done in the computation. And so a traditional von Neumann architecture uses about 2.5 picojoules per byte per Mac. So at Untether, we decided to radically rethink that process, right? We focused on inference first, and therefore we made a chip that we could store all of the coefficients onto the chip itself. That minimizes the data movement. We're natively a batch equal to one. And instead of having long, um, narrow buses like you see in a von Neumann architecture, we put the processing element right next to the actual memory cell. This does two things for us. First, it maximizes concurrently concurrency. We have hundreds of thousands of these processing elements in a single chip, so we can be massively parallelized. And secondly, because each processing element has its own memory, okay, we have tremendous memory bandwidth, very short distance, but very wide, on the order of 260 terabytes per second, compared to, say, a 1.6 terabytes per second you'd see in a GPU type of architecture. The other thing about this technology is we use a standard CMOS process. Everything's digital. We use standard off-the-shelf SRAM cells, so it's deployable at scale. We add redundancy to ensure to you know to ensure our yields are high for any defects that may happen during processing. But overall, we have something that, at its base, is defined by its architecture and not trying to do new esoteric things with process technology. So the device itself is the Run AI 200. Each chip has 200 megabytes of on-chip SRAM, and that's distributed across 511 memory banks, and which I'll get into in a moment. And then the memory banks, as I mentioned, are the processing elements. We have over a quarter of a million of these processing elements, which gives us up to 500 tera operations per second of performance. We are inference focused, and so we're optimizing for an int 8 data type. Um, and that allows us to do lots of optimizations to ensure that we can get this type of performance. We have a scalable voltage and frequency. So we have what we call our sport mode, um, where we're running at full tops at 500 tops. Um, and we also have an eco mode where we can scale down both the frequency and the voltage to find that sweet spot to give us the best tops per watt number. And in this case, it's at eight tops per watt. So the architecture um, in and of itself shown here is based upon the memory bank, as I mentioned. Each memory bank has 385 kilobytes of SRAM and 512 processors. And there's a custom risk controller in there that controls the overall, overall operation. These memory banks are arranged into rows and they're fed by a pipeline bus. This comes from a PCIe interface on our chip 
And in this way, each memory bank can stream in or DMA data to itself and then stream out information back out to the host processor. And this pipeline bus is row based and each memory bank can access it either above or below itself. And in that way, we get ultimate flexibility in placing graphs onto the chip because we don't have to start at a certain point and we don't have to stop at a certain point. For the local interconnects, we have our east-west connectivity as a rotator cuff. And you'll see why we call it that. It essentially allows us to rotate activations between processing elements and between memory banks. For the north-south local interconnect, we have a direct row transfer. Because we're memory based, we actually move entire rows of data um, through the memory banks themselves. And we can do that both internally to a memory bank and between the memory banks. So in that way, we are ensuring that we're trying to move things the shortest distance possible to conserve energy, but still provide the flexibility to do a lot of different AI compute loads. So as you can see in this diagram, the processing element is located directly in the memory array. Coefficients are stored in the SRAM array and they directly feed what's called the C or coefficient register. Notice that we have memory above and below the processing element. That's so that we can pitch match the distance that these coefficients can travel and make it as short as possible. If we had made one long narrow one, obviously the one farthest away has more to travel. You have to use beefier drivers. So in this way, we're trying to, again, really try to improve the efficiency. The other part of the multiply accumulate is the activation, which is fed by the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff allows that A register to address any of the other A registers from the nearest neighbors, either three to the right or three to the left. And in that way, we can rotate through activations to each processing element, do the compute, store it, and then take it to the next processing element. This allows us to do something called gem B, which is matrix of vector multiplication. We see that quite a bit in natural language processing networks like BERT. However, we can also do multiple gem Bs to make a gem M or a matrix to matrix general multiplication. And so in that way, again, we're really making sure that we're minimizing energy. We also have a zero detect circuitry within the processing element so that if an activation or a coefficient happens to be zero, we turn off the multiply accumulate so that we can save about half of the power consumption. Um, and that way we take advantage of natural sparsity that you may see in either convolutional neural networks or natural language processing. And because each processing element gets its own SRAM, we get this tremendous memory bandwidth, right, of 262 terabytes total of on-chip memory bandwidth. So this ultimately means that we can take that multiply accumulate value, which was a 2.5 picojoules per byte per Mac, down to 432 femtojoules per byte per Mac. So that's a 6x power reduction because we've removed the DRAM fetch. And we're making sure that the fetching of the activations and the coefficients is as short as possible and the transport distance is as short as possible. And then so now we have kind of a balanced fetch power versus multiply accumulate power. These processing elements are arranged, as I mentioned, in a memory block. Okay, and so you can see here that in the processing element, we have 64 columns by eight rows. Each processing element has a four by 188 byte of memory split into a top and a bottom, each with 94 bytes. Here you can see how the rotator cuff spans the memory bank and goes to other memory banks so that we can move activations between memory banks and the direct row transfer moves things up and down in the north-south direction. This RISC processor controls all of the uh, activities. It runs its own code. Um, and because the memory banks are running asynchronously from each other, we provide buffering for the direct row transfer and also for the pipeline bus data coming in and out. And that way we avoid stalling the memory bank and allow some intermediate storage in these buffers as we're transferring data between the memory banks. We designed our own custom RISC processor. And that was really because we knew we need, had a lot of custom instructions that we wanted to do, and we had state machines that we wanted to make. These state machines take commonly used long instruction executions, like doing gem Bs, 
doing a direct row transfer, doing memory rotations. And we can just fire off the state machine and allow the risk processor to do other functionality. For example, it handles the bank-to-bank -bank communications using the bank-to-bank -bank message registers shown here. Each of the rows of the processing elements has its own row ALU in this risk processor. That allows us to aggregate data that's in the PEs along with internal storage registers to allow us to do aggregation functions like reduce, softmax, and other types of reduction functions that you see commonly in neural networks. And in this way, you can see that we've really tailored the entire architecture to be able to do AI workloads. Here you can see the actual die photograph and you can see how the memory banks shown in orange and the processing elements are shown in um, black. The rotator cuff itself is inside the black of the processing elements, but you can see how the processing elements now are placed directly in the memory array. And then on the left side, you have the risk processor and then the pipeline bus, which operates above and below each memory bank. So this is a very scalable architecture. Um, we've chosen for our first chip to be 200 megabytes, um, but we can make them to be larger or smaller, and we can optimize that based upon yields that we see in different process technologies. With this attention to efficiency, it allows us to create our Tsunami Accelerator card, in which we can put four of our devices onto a single PCIe card to give us two peta operations per second per card, which is more than 2x anything that we've seen um, announced to date. The chips are interconnected using a PCIe switch chip. It natively has at the edge a by 16 Gen 4 connectivity, which then bifurcates that into four ports of by 4 Gen 4 that feed each of the four of our devices. We can run this in both eco and sports mode, and we have a runtime API that controls the communications between the cards. So this tremendous tops also translates into tremendous performance for um, AI workloads. In the case of ResNet 50, we can do 80,000 frames per second per card. In the case of BERT Base, we can do 12,000 queries per second per card. And so that's between three and four times the compute density that we've seen in any other announced products. And we get this type of compute density because of our efficiency. Right? If you look at frames per second per watt of ResNet 50, uh, we're about 2x the closest competitor. And similarly with BERT Base, the queries per second per watt are about 2x. Again, that allows us to put into a PCIe form factor and power envelope this type of compute density. Now, if you were listening to some of the other sessions earlier this week, there was a lot of talk about software. And software really is the window into the chip. And so we spend a lot of time working on it. Like... Sorry, somebody broke in there. Um, so we try to abstract all of the optimizations and automate as much as possible. So within your ML framework, whether it's TensorFlow or PyTorch, you create your network, you do your training, and then we take care of doing the automation. We do the quantization. We allow you to specify constraints to do the lower graph level optimizations. We do the physical allocations. And we provide extensive visualizations where you can see the actual layout of the graph. This happens to be a, an example of ResNet 50. You can also see the cycles that are being used on a per bank basis to see exactly how the code is running. Now, in our breakout session later, we'll be having a demonstration of this tool flow from our VP of Software Engineering. So I encourage you, if you have more interest in the software, to please attend that. But I wanted to um, talk about two of the optimizations that we do. Um, one is in the quantization. Of course, we're an integer machine. So you have to move from floating point to, to into a fixed point. A network like ResNet 50 is relatively tolerant to quantization. It goes from a top one accuracy of 76.5% to about 76.3%. That's probably sufficient. But a smaller network that's more susceptible to the quantization noise, like MobileNet V1, okay, we see that we lose a full percentage point in accuracy in doing this quantization. So we provide an untether aware training process, which is a post-quantization retraining and some other optimizations, all of it push button. 
in order to recoup some of that accuracy using a small subset of the overall training data set. And in this situation, we were able to recover almost all of the accuracy by doing this untether aware training. We provide the user the ability to enter constraints so that they can optimize their um, graphs, either for efficiency, which is the smallest area and therefore the smallest power consumption, or for performance. One of the unique aspects of a spatial architecture like ours is that we can duplicate layers so that I can have multiple instances of a layer running simultaneously, splicing the data and parallelizing things um, so that I can increase the performance at the trade-off of silicon area and power consumption. But we do that automatically um, for the user, depending upon which optimization flags they want to use. Now, one other thing that we do automatically is multi-chip partitioning. Um, because there are graphs certainly that are bigger than our current chip, um, we can look at a graph, find the best place to split the graph in order to minimize chip-to-chip -chip communications. Um, because we want to do that, because any chip-to-chip -chip communication can reduce, can increase latency and also increase your power consumption. So we analyze the graphs using cost functions on the edges in order to find the exact right place to split those graphs. And we can split that across multiple chips on a card, and we can even split graphs from across multiple cards on a server so that we can um, handle any of these larger networks. And again, we hide these optimizations from the user. We just have them specify in their constraints how many chips they want to use, and we'll do the optimization for you. And like I said, we'll have a demonstration of the tools during the breakout session if you'd like to attend that. So the PetOp era, as we call it, has just become available with two PETA operations per card. Um, we have now the highest compute density card available for AI inference workloads. We are sampling now and we have tools in customers' hands and we are moving towards commercial availability in the first quarter of 2021. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, thanks uh, for... Um, uh, introducing such a, uh, an amazing product. Uh, it's great to see performance leadership uh, and from a new company. Um, so um, so that, that was a very interesting presentation.